Hello, I'm Joanna Swords. Welcome to the Glories of Mary. In the book, The Glories of Mary, St. Alphonsus explains to us the words of the well-known Catholic hymn or prayer, Salve Regina, or in English, Hail Holy Queen. The Salve Regina has been a part of our Catholic history for at least a thousand years. It is recited or sung daily by many Catholics around the world and often as part of another Catholic devotion. For example, at the end of the Holy Rosary of the Blessed Virgin Mary, we say the Hail Holy Queen. At the end of the Divine Office, or uh, sometimes called the Roman Breviary, which is said daily by priests, for a large portion of the liturgical year, they sing or they recite the Hail Holy Queen. Likewise, at the end of the Little Office of the Blessed Virgin Mary, which is said daily by many religious sisters and brothers, they also say the Hail Holy Queen. The Salve Regina is also sung or said at the end of many chaplets, often called little rosaries, uh, such as the Chapel of the Seven Sorrows of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And it is also said after many novenas, of which we have hundreds. Um, probably a better known novena would be the efficacious novena to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, which was said daily by St. Padre Pio. In today's reading of the Glories of Mary, we will continue with chapter three, where we left off in our last reading in which St. Alphonsus is explaining to us the words, Mary, our hope. Before we begin today, let us first ask the Holy Ghost and our Blessed Mother for guidance so that we may understand and be able to apply to our daily life what we are reading today in the book, The Glories of Mary. Please join me in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Come, Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful and enkindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, who by the light of the Holy Ghost didst instruct the hearts of the faithful. Grant that in the same spirit we may always be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And so we begin today's reading of the Glories of Mary by St. Alphonsus Liguri. Again, St. Alphonsus is explaining to us the words from the Salve Regina, Mary, our hope. And he says, Mary is the hope of sinners. St. Basil of Seleucia remarks, that if God granted to some who were only his servants such power that not only their touch but even their shadows healed the sick, how much greater power must we suppose that he has granted to her who was not only his handmaid but his mother? We may indeed say that our Lord has given us Mary as a public infirmary in which all who are sick, poor, and destitute can be received. But now I ask, in hospitals built expressly for the poor, who has the greatest claim to admission? Certainly the most infirm and those who are in the greatest need. And for this reason, should anyone find himself devoid of merit and overwhelmed with spiritual infirmities, that is to say, sin, he can thus address Mary, O lady, thou art the refuge of the sick poor. Do not reject me. For as I am the poorest and the most infirm of all, I have the greatest right to be welcomed by thee. Let us then cry out with St. Thomas of Villanova, O Mary, we poor sinners know no other refuge than thee, for thou art our only hope, and on thee we rely for our salvation. Thou art our only advocate with Jesus Christ, to thee we all turn ourselves. In the revelations of St. Bridget, Mary is called the star preceding the sun giving us to understand that when devotion towards the Divine Mother begins to manifest itself or to show itself in a soul, that, in a soul that is in a state of sin, it is a certain mark that before long God will enrich that soul with His grace. The glorious Saint Bonaventure, in order to revive the confidence of sinners in the protection of Mary, places before them the picture of a tempestuous sea into which sinners have already fallen from the ship of Divine Grace. They are already dashed about on every side by remorse of conscience and by fear of the judgments of God. They are without light or guide and are on the point of losing the last breath of hope 
and falling into despair. Then it is that our Lord, pointing out Mary to them, who is commonly called the star of the sea, raises his voice and says, O poor lost sinners, do not despair. Raise up your eyes and cast them on this beautiful star. Breathe again with confidence, for it will save you from this tempest and will guide you into the port of salvation. St. Bernard says the same thing. If thou would not be lost in the tempest, cast your eyes on the star and invoke Mary. The devout Blosius declares that she, that is Our Lady, is the only refuge of those who have offended God, the asylum of all who are oppressed by temptation, calamity, or persecution. This mother is all mercy, benignity, and sweetness, not only to the just, but also to despairing sinners, so that no sooner does Mary perceive sinners coming to her and seeking her health from their hearts, then she aids them, she welcomes them, and obtains their pardon from her son. She knows not how to despise anyone, no matter how unworthy he may be of mercy, and therefore she denies her protection to no one. She consoles all and is no sooner called upon than she helps whoever it may be that invokes her. Mary, by her sweetness, often awakens sinners and draws them to her, especially those who are at the most, most at enmity with God and the most deeply plunged into the lethargy of sin. And then by the same means, Mary excites them effectually and prepares them for grace and thus renders them fit for the kingdom of heaven. God has created this his beloved daughter of so compassionate and sweet a disposition that no one can fear to have recourse to her. The pious author concludes in these words, it is impossible for anyone to perish who attentively and with humility cultivates devotion towards this divine mother. In the book of Ecclesiasticus, Mary is called a plane tree, as it says, as a plane tree, I was exalted. And she is so called that sinners may understand that as the plane tree gives shelter to travelers from the heat of the sun, so does Mary invite them to take shelter under her protection from the wrath of God justly enkindled against them. St. Bonaventure remarks that the prophet Isaiah complained of the times in which he lived. It says in the book of Isaiah, Behold, thou art angry and we have sinned. There is none that riseth up and takes hold of thee. And then he makes the following, St. Bernard makes the following, if Bonaventure makes the following commentary about these words from the book of Isaiah. He says, it is true, O Lord, that at the time there was none to raise up sinners. That is during the time of Isaiah in the Old Testament, there was none to raise up sinners and withhold thy wrath, for Mary was not yet born. Before Mary, to quote the saint's own words, before Mary, there was no one who could thus dare to restrain the arm of God. But now if God is angry with a sinner and Mary takes him under her protection, she withholds the avenging arm of her son and saves the sinner. And so no one, he continues, and so no one can be found more fit for this office than Mary, who seizes the sword of divine justice with her own hands to prevent it from falling upon and punishing the sinner. On the same subject, Richard of St. Lawrence says that God, before the birth of Mary, complained by the mouth of the prophet Ezekiel that there was no one to rise up and withhold him, that is, withhold God, from chastising sinners, but that he could find no one because this office was reserved for our Blessed Lady, who withholds the arm of God until he is pacified. Basil of Seleucia encourages sinners, saying, O sinner, do not be discouraged, but have recourse to Mary in all your necessities. Call her to your assistance, for you will fi always find Mary ready to help you. For such is the divine will that for such is the divine will that Mary should help all in every kind of necessity. This mother of mercy has so great a desire to save the most abandoned sinners that she herself goes in search of them in order to help them. And if, they have, and if they have recourse to her, she knows how to find the means to render them acceptable to God. The patriarch Isaac, 
as it says in the in the in the I'm sorry, as it says in the, in, the, in the book of Genesis, the patriarch Isaac, desiring to eat some wild animal, promised his blessing to his son Esau on his procuring this food for him. But Rebekah, who was the mother of Esau and Jacob, was anxious that her other son Jacob should receive, receive the blessing of Esau. And therefore she called Jacob and said to him, go thy way to the flock, bring me two kids, that is baby goats of the best, that I may make of them meat for thy father, such as he would gladly eat. St. Antoninus says that Rebekah was a figure of Mary who commands the angels to bring her sinners. That is, when Rebekah told her son Jacob to bring her two, two baby goats from the flock, Mary, there was a figure of Mary who, who commands the angels to bring her sinners, that she may adorn sinners in such a way by obtaining for them sorrow and purpose of amending their lives as to render them dear and acceptable to the Lord. And here we may well apply to our Blessed Lady the words of the Abbot Franco, O truly sagacious woman who so well knew how to dress these kids, these goats, that they are not only equal to but often superior in flavor to real venison. The Blessed Virgin herself revealed to Saint Bridget, she said, there is no sinner in the world However much he may be at enmity with God who does not return to God and recover God's grace, if he has recourse to, that is, if he calls upon Mary and asks for her assistance. The same St. Bridget one day heard our Lord Jesus Christ himself address his mother, address the Blessed Virgin Mary, and say that she, meaning Our Lady, would be ready to obtain the grace of God for Lucifer himself, if only Lucifer would humble himself so far as to seek her aid. That proud spirit Lucifer, of course, we know will never humble himself so far as to implore the protection of Mary. But if such a thing were possible, Mary would be sufficiently compassionate and her prayers would have sufficient power to obtain both forgiveness and salvation for him from God. But that which cannot be verified with regard to the devil is, ver is verified in the case of sinners who do have recourse to this compassionate mother. Noah's ark was a true figure of Mary, for as, for as in the ark there were all kinds of beasts that were saved, so under the mantle of Mary all sinners who by their vices and sensuality are already like beasts find refuge. But with this big difference, as a pious author remarks, that while the brutes that entered, the ark, that entered Noah's ark remained brutes, that is the wolf remained a wolf, the tiger a tiger, under the mantle of Mary on the other hand, the wolf becomes a lamb and the tiger a dove. One day St. Gertrude saw Mary with her mantle open and under it there were many wild beasts of different kinds, leopards, tigers, lions, bears. And she saw that not only our Blessed Lady did not drive them away, but that she welcomed and caressed them with her benign hand. The saint understood that these wild beasts were miserable sinners who are welcomed by Mary with sweetness and love the moment they have recourse to her, the moment they call upon her. It was then not without reason that St. Bernard addressed the Blessed Virgin saying, Thou, O Lady, does not reject any sinner who approaches thee, no matter how loathsome and repugnant he may be. If he asks thy assistance, thou does not disdain to extend thy compassionate hand to him, to extricate him from the gulf of despair. May our God be eternally blessed and thanked, O most amiable Mary, for having created thee so sweet and benign, even towards the most miserable sinners. Truly unfortunate is he who loves thee, who does not love thee, and who, having it in his power to obtain thy help, has no confidence in thee. He who has not recourse to Mary is lost, but who was ever lost that had recourse to the most blessed virgin? It is related in the sacred scriptures that Booz allowed Ruth to gather the ears of corn after the reapers. St. Bonaventure says that as Ruth found favor with Booz, so has Mary found favor with our Lord and is also allowed to gather the ears of corn after the reapers. The reapers followed by Mary are all evangelical laborers, missionaries, preachers, and confessors who are constantly reaping souls for God. But there are some hardened and rebellious souls which are abandoned even by these, even by these confessors and preachers. 
To Mary alone it is granted to save them by her powerful intercession. Truly unfortunate are they if they do not allow themselves to be gathered even by the sweet lady. They will indeed be most certainly lost and accursed. But on the other hand, blessed is he who has recourse to this good mother. The devout Blosius says, There is not in the world any sinner, no matter how revolting and wicked, who is despised or rejected by Mary. She can, she wills, and she knows how to reconcile the sinner to her most beloved son, if only he will seek her assistance. With reason, then, St. John Damascene says to Our Lady, With reason, then, my most sweet queen, do we call thee the hope of those who are in despair. With reason did St. Lawrence Justinian call Mary the hope of malefactors, and another ancient writer called Mary the only hope of sinners. St. Ephraim calls Mary the safe harbor of all sailing on the sea of the world. St. Ephraim also called Mary the consolation of those who are to be condemned. With reason, finally, does St. Bernard exhort even the desperate not to despair. And full of joy and tenderness towards his most dear mother, he lovingly exclaims, And who, O lady, can be without confidence in thee, since thou dost assist even those who are in despair. And I doubt not that whenever we have recourse to thee, we shall obtain all that we desire. Let him then who is without hope, hope in thee. St. Alphonsus, as we, as we come to the end of chapter 3, once again gives us an, an example, a true Catholic story from our, from our Catholic history. St. Antonine relates that there was a sinner who was at enmity with God and who had had a vision in which he found himself before the dread tribunal. The devil accused, accused the sinner and Mary defended him. The devil produced the catalog of, the, of his sins. It was thrown into the scales of divine justice and his sins weighed far more than all his good works. But then his great advocate, the Blessed Virgin, extending her sweet hand, placed it on the balance and so caused it to turn in favor of her client, giving the sinner thereby to understand that Our Lady would obtain his pardon if he changed his life. And this he did after the vision and was entirely converted. <clears throat> St. Alphonsus, uh, once again, has composed a prayer for us at the end of this chapter. Please join me. O most pure Virgin Mary, I venerate thy most holy heart, which was the delight and resting place of God, thy heart overflowing with humility, purity, and divine love. I, an unhappy sinner, approach thee with a heart all loathsome and wounded. O compassionate mother, disdain me not on this account. Let such a sight rather move thee to greater tenderness and excite thee to help me. Do not stay to seek virtues or merit in me before assisting me. I am lost, and the only thing I merit is hell. See only my confidence in thee and the purpose I have to amend my life. Consider all that Jesus has done and suffered for me, and then abandon me if thou can. I offer thee all the pains of his life, the cold that he endured in the stable, his journey into Egypt, the blood which he shed, the poverty, sweats, sorrows, and death that he endured for me, and this in thy presence. For the love of Jesus, take charge of my salvation. Ah, my mother, I will not and cannot fear that thou wilt reject me, now that I have recourse to thee and ask thy help. Did I fear this, I should be offering an outrage to thy mercy, which goes in quest of the wretched, in order to help them. O lady, de deny not thy compassion to one to whom Jesus has not denied his blood. But the merits of this blood will not be applied to me unless thou dost recommend me to God. Through thee do I hope for salvation. I ask not for riches, honors, or earthly goods. I seek only the grace of God, love towards thy Son, the accomplishment of his will, and his heavenly kingdom, that I may love him eternally. Is it possible that thou wilt not hear me? <coughs> Excuse me. No, for already thou hast granted my prayer, as I hope. Already thou dost pray for me. Already thou obtains for me the graces that I ask. Already thou takes me under thy protection. 
My mother, do not abandon me. Never, never cease to pray for me until thou dost see me safe in heaven at thy feet, blessing and thanking thee forever. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. And so we begin chapter four of the glories of Mary, in which St. Alphonsus explains to us the words from the Salve Regina, to thee do we cry, poor banished children of Eve. He also refers to it, sum summarizing in a way, calling this chapter, Mary, our help. He says the promptitude of Mary, how quick she is to assist those who call upon her. Truly unfortunate are we poor children of Eve, for guilty before God of her fault and condemned to the same penalty, we have to wander about in this valley of tears as exiles from our country and to weep over our many afflictions of body and soul. But blessed is he who in the midst of these sorrows often turns to the comfortress of the world, to the refuge of the unfortunate, to the great mother of God and devoutly calls upon her and invokes her. As it says in the book of Proverbs, blessed is the man that heareth me and that watcheth daily at my gates. Blessed, says Mary, is he who listens to my counsels and watches continually at the gate of my mercy and invokes my intercession and aid. The Holy Church carefully teaches us, her children, with what attention and confidence we should unceasingly have recourse to this loving protectress. For this purpose, and for this purpose commands a worship that is peculiar or specific to Mary. And not only this, but Holy Mother Church has instituted so many festivals that are celebrated throughout the year in honor of this great queen. The church devotes one day in the week, that is Saturdays, and in a special manner in honor of Mary. In the divine office, all ecclesiastics and religious are daily obliged to invoke Mary in the name of all Christians. And finally, Holy Mother Church desires that all the faithful should salute this most holy mother of God three times a day at the sound of the Angelus bell. And that we may understand the confidence that the Holy Church has in Mary, we need only remember that in all public calamities, Holy Mother Church invariably invites all to have recourse to the protection of this Divine Mother by novenas, prayers, processions, by visiting the churches dedicated in her honor and by visiting her sacred images. And this is what Mary desires. She wishes us always to seek her and invoke her aid not as if she were begging us of these honors and marks of veneration, for they are in no way proportioned to her merit. But she desires them that by such means our confidence and devotion may be increased, so that she may be, able, may be able to give us greater succor and comfort. She seeks for those, says St. Bonaventure, who approach her devoutly and with reverence, for such she loves, nourishes, and adopts as her children. St. Bonaventure remarks that Ruth, whose name signifies seeing and hastening, was also a figure of Mary. For Mary, seeing our miseries, hastens in her mercy to succor us. Novarino adds that Mary, in the greatness of her desire to help us, cannot admit of delay, for she is in no way an avaricious guardian of the graces that she has at her, dismo at her disposal as Mother of Mercy, and cannot do otherwise then immediately shower down the treasures of her liberality on her servants. Oh, how prompt is this good mother to help those who call upon her. Richard of St. Lawrence says that Mary is prompt to bestow the milk of mercy on all who ask of it. He also assures us that the compassion of Mary is poured out on everyone who asks it, even should it be sought for by no, other, by no other prayer than a simple Hail Mary. Where Novarino declares that the Blessed Virgin not only runs, but flies to assist him who invokes her. He says that she, that is Mary, in the exercise of her mercy, knows not how to act differently from God. For as God flies at once to the assistance of those who beg his aid, being faithful to his promise, ask and you shall receive, as it says in the Gospels, so Mary, whenever she is invoked, is at once ready to assist him who prays to her. God has wings when he assists his own and immediately flies to them, 
Mary also takes wing when she is about to fly to our aid. And hence we see who the woman was spoken of in the following verse in the book of the Apocalypse, to whom two great eagles' wings were given, that she might fly to the desert. It says, And there were given to the woman two wings of a great eagle, that she may fl might fly into the desert. Ribiera explains these wings to mean the love with which Mary always flew to God. She has the wings of an eagle, for she flies with the love of God. But the blessed Amadeus, more to our purpose, remarks that these wings of an eagle signify the velocity exceeding that of the seraphim with which Mary always flies to the succor of her children. This will explain the passage in the Gospel of St. Luke, in which we are told that when Mary went to visit, the sh to visit and shower graces on St. Elizabeth and her whole family, she was not slow but went with speed, as it says in the Gospel of Luke, and Mary, rising up, went into the hill country with haste. This concludes today's reading of the glories of Mary. I thank you for joining me and hope that we'll, you will join me again in our next reading. Before we end, let us finish with the Salve Regina. Please join me in prayer. Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. To thee do we cry, poor banished children of Eve. To thee do we send up our sighs, mourning and weeping in this valley of tears. Turn them, most gracious advocate, thine eyes of mercy toward us, and after this our exile, show unto us the blessed fruit of thy womb, Jesus. O clement, O loving, O sweet Virgin Mary, pray for us, O Holy Mother of God, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. May Almighty God bless you, your family, and your loved ones. Please pray for me and know that I am praying for you. And as, let us remember these words which St. Alphonsus has given us today, both his own words and the words of many of the great saints and doctors of the church. They are telling us to go to Jesus through Mary. As we say in Latin and has been said down through our Catholic history, ad Jesum per Mariam, to Jesus through Mary. In the final vision on October 13, 1917, Our Lady silently held out the scapular, a gesture which indicates that she wants everyone to wear it.